Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and welcome back to part 4 of Rocks Part 1. So before we go any further, let's just quickly get the code word done. So the code word of this presentation is soccer, as in the sport, so soccer, S-O-C-C-E-R. So please write that down and make sure you put it somewhere safe. Okay, so we've covered regional metamorphism and we've covered contact metamorphism. So now let's move on to the, the third type of metamorphism, which is subduction metamorphism. So subduction metamorphism is, as the name suggests, associated with subduction. And I'm sure you remember subduction takes place at convergent plate boundaries, uh, uh, specifically ocean-ocean and ocean-continent convergent plate boundaries. Now, subduction metamorphism is intimately related to regional metamorphism when it's occurring at an ocean-continent convergent boundary. However, the pressure and temperature regime for a well, for subduction metamorphism is of course completely different to that of regional metamorphism. So with regional metamorphism, the pressure and the temperature increases the deeper you go in the mountain range. However, in the case of subduction metamorphism, it is once again high pressure because you have these two massive pieces of crust smashing into each other, so that's obviously going to produce a lot of pressure. And at the same time, you have your piece of oceanic crust subducting down into the mantle. Well, once again, that's also going to help to increase the pressure. So your piece of subducting oceanic crust is going to be under significant pressure. However, the temperature is kept artificially low. And the, the temperature is kept low due to the circulation of water. So all that water that's in your piece of oceanic crust, so remember it's going to be in the minerals, it's going to be in cracks in the rock, it's going to be in the sediment which is on top of the oceanic crust which is also being subducted down into the mantle. So there's loads of water in that area. And so what happens is, is this water begins to get heated up obviously and as it gets heated up it obviously starts to circulate just like water convecting in a pan. So what happens is the water gets heated up, it circulates out of the area, it cools down, and it returns. And so the circulation of the water is just constantly taking heat away from the subduction zone and redistributing it somewhere else. So it helps to keep the subduction zone itself artificially cool. And this means you have this rather weird set of conditions where you have very, very high pressures, but geologically speaking, surprisingly low temperatures. And so this is going to give you a, a you know, an interesting selection of minerals. So in terms of where uh, blue schist fasces, so this is the most common type of subduction zone related rock, in terms of where a blue schist uh, fasces grade rock will occur is in the subducting piece of oceanic crust and the contact between the subducting piece of oceanic crust and the continental crust. So here's our diagram right here. So you can see this is an ocean continent convergent plate boundary. So here's our piece of continental crust and here's our piece of oceanic crust. And we can see our piece of oceanic lithosphere is subducting down into the mantle here underneath the continental lithosphere. So obviously here we have our mountain range. So we're going to have regional metamorphism taking place there. And we're going to have the blue schist metamorphism taking place in the piece of subducting oceanic crust here and right at the front of the continental crust right here. Now the thing you need to take note of are these two lines, the red dashed line and the blue dashed line. So these are uh, isotherms and they're showing us where we would expect a, a, a 400 temperature, 400 Celsius uh, temperature to occur and a 600 Celsius temperature to occur. Now you would expect these uh, isotherms to come just straight across and meet up there. Same with the 600, you'd expect it to come straight across and continue over there. But you can quite clearly see there is a noticeable depression in the temperature as you move over the subduction zone. And this is because of all the circulating water taking that heat away and redistributing it in other locations. It helps to keep this uh, area of rock distinctly much colder than it should be. And so that helps to create these rather interesting and somewhat weird conditions. And so these high temperature, high pressure conditions will produce a very, very distinct sequence of minerals. So you'll get minerals like kyanite and glaucophane appearing. These minerals will only tend to occur in subduction uh, metamorphic settings because they will only form in these high pressure, low temperature conditions. 
Okay, so now we've been through the uh, three types of uh, metamorphism, let's have a think about some uh, unfoliated and foliated metamorphic rocks which will commonly occur. So we've already covered uh, the, the first type of uh, unfoliated metamorphic rock, which are, of course, the horn felses. So they're created by the contact metamorphism of a basalt or a shale. And once again, because it's contact metamorphism, high temperature, low pressure, so there's nothing making the minerals align. Now, in the early diagram, we also saw contact metamorphism of a sandstone and a limestone, giving us quartzites and marbles, respectively. Now, uh, quartzites and marbles are not limited to contact metamorphism. You can also get quartzites and marbles forming in regional metamorphic settings as well. The reason they don't have a foliation is simply because the crystals in a sandstone and a limestone are not platy, so flat like a piece of paper, or elongate like a pencil, long and slender. So the only way you can get a foliation is if you make the crystals align themselves and if you want the crystals to align themselves well they have to have the correct shape they have to be either like a piece of paper so platy or they have to be elongate so long and slender the quartz crystals in a quartzite and the uh, calcite crystals in the limestone do not have those properties and so you can put a quartzite or a you can put a quartzite or a marble under quite high pressures and temperatures and they're not going to show any kind of mineral alignment because the crystals do not have the proportions to do it okay so don't think that marbles and quartzites are exclusively contact metamorphic rocks they're not they can also occur in regional metamorphic settings as well We've also touched on eclogites earlier. So eclogites are produced when a basalt enters the mantle. Very high pressure, very high temperature. But obviously because the pressure is equal in all directions, it means there's no one direction which, you know, uh, there's no one orientation through which the minerals are trying to be uh, compressed. So because the pressure is equal in all directions, the minerals don't align. Now, we also have these three types of rock up here. We have green stones, amphibolites, and granulites. Now, you might remember these, these rock types because they occur here on the fasces diagram. So we have green stones would occur in the green schist fasces field, amphibolites would occur obviously in the amphibolite field, and granulites would occur in the granulite field. Now, you can form green stones, amphibolites, and granulites through contact metamorphism. Once again, high temperature, low pressure. And you can also form them most commonly through regional metamorphism. Now you would expect, because it's regional metamorphism, quite high pressure, you would expect that that pressure would make the minerals align. However, that's not always the case. Sometimes you can form greenstones, amphibolites and granulites towards the margins of your mountain range. And in that situation, the pressure would tend to be a little lower. And so the force to make the minerals align would be a lot lower. And if that, you know, and if there's no really strong force trying to make the minerals align, no really strong compression, then the minerals aren't going to do it. And so you will end up with these three rocks which show no distinct orientation. So let's have a look at some of them. So here we have ourselves a green stone. You can see it has this rather distinct green color to it. And this is because of the presence of chlorite, actinolite, and epidote. Each of them are green minerals. And so they're going to give the rock a very distinct green color. Now, as we increase the pressure and temperature, the uh, chlorite, the epidote, and the actinolite are going to become unstable. They're going to break down. And they're going to be replaced by hornblende, the black mineral, plagioclase, the white mineral, and garnet, the red mineral. And that's going to give us an amphibolite. If we increase the pressure and temperature further, eventually the amphibole here is going to become unstable and it's going to change into pyroxene, at which point we've entered granulite fasces. So this is a granulite right here. Now this particular granulite, I will admit, does actually have a, a light foliation to it, a light layer. You can see it coming from left to right there. But you can see here we have these bands, these kind of red-brown bands. They're going to be a mixture of garnet and pyroxene. And then we have these lighter regions, which are going to be dominated by a mixture of quartz and feldspars. So we can also see here, we have ourselves uh, two different rocks. So we have ourselves a quartzite, which are the, the golden layers. 
and we have ourselves a, a horn fells, which are these black grey layers. Now you're thinking, hold on a second, I can quite clearly see a layering here. And you're right, you can see a layering, it's quite obvious. But the layering you're seeing is not due to metamorphism. It's actually a reflection of the original sedimentary rock which has been metamorphosed. So once upon a time, this was a layer of sandstone. This was a layer of mudstone, sandstone, mudstone, sandstone, mudstone. And then that sedimentary sequence got metamorphosed through contact metamorphism. And the result was you got the sandstones turned into quartzite and the mudstones turned into a hornfels. But you can see with both the quartzite and the hornfels, there's no preferential layering of the minerals. So there's no fabric, no foliation. So marbles and quartzites will very often not show any kind of foliation. And eclogites, as we've discussed, will also typically not show a foliation because the pressure is equal in all directions in the mantle. So are there any other useful terms uh, when it comes to describing metamorphic rocks? Well, there are a couple. So if you remember when we were discussing igneous rocks, we used the term porphyritic. And porphyritic was an igneous rock where we had some much larger crystals, which we call phenocrysts, sitting in a ground mass of much finer crystals. Well, that's an exclusively igneous term, but we do see the same thing occurring in metamorphic rocks as well. And so in the case of metamorphic rocks, it's not called porphyritic, it's called porphyroblastic. So you can only metamorphic rocks can be porphyroblastic. And in a porphyroblastic texture, we have these large crystals, which are called porphyroblasts, and they're sitting in a finer ground mass of much smaller crystals. So it looks like the porphyritic texture, which we have in um, igneous rocks, but you will see it in metamorphic rocks instead. And you'll know it's a metamorphic rock because you will see dis you know, some distinct minerals which you would not be able to get in an igneous setting. So for instance, you might see a porphyroblastic form, you, know, you might see big garnet crystals, or you might see big crystals of other minerals like cordierite or maybe andalusite. Now, the, those three minerals are commonly associated with metamorphic conditions. And so when you see them, you instantly know you have yourself a metamorphic rock. So you know it's going to be, you know, you're going to refer to it as a porphyroblastic rock rather than a porphyritic rock. Another term that uh, is very commonly used is granoblastic. Granoblastic essentially means equigranular. So it means if in your rock, the crystals are all the same size. And it's very commonly associated with rocks like quartzites, marbles, granulites, and hornfelses. If you look at those rocks very carefully, you'll see most of the crystals within them will actually be pretty much the same size. So you'd refer to those as, you know, it'd be a granoblastic quartzite, a granoblastic marble, a granoblastic granulite, for instance, you know, etc. Now, when it comes to foliations, there's actually three rocks that have a, you know, the three very distinct rocks that show a foliation. And so they're allowed to have their own, you know, their own subclass of foliation. So those rocks are slates, schists, and gneisses. And they show this very, very distinct layering to the rock. And so they're given their own terms. So a schist will have a slaty cleavage produced by an alignment of clays and mica minerals. A schist will have a schistosity, which is produced by the alignment of mica minerals. And a gneiss will have a nicicity, or nicosity, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And that's produced by light and dark bands of minerals. It looks kind of like a, like a zebra pattern. So foliated metamorphic rocks come in two varieties depending on you know, what shape the crystals are which are being aligned. So the first type is foliated or lipidoblastic, and that's produced by a parallel alignment of platy minerals, minerals that are like a piece of paper, very broad but very thin. The other type of metamorphic, the, so the, the other type of foliation is lineated, also called nematoblastic. And that's produced by elongate minerals. So, you know, they're the shape of a pencil, for instance, long and slender. You'll get that with minerals like amphibole. 
So in terms of how we get these foliations, well, there's a couple of ways we can do it. The first way is the crystals can simply be pushed over through physical compression. Okay, the pressure can be so high that the, the crystals in the rock will literally rotate and orientate themselves parallel to each other. The other thing that can happen is as your rock is being metamorphosed, it's under pressure. And so as the minerals in your rock change, the new crystals that develop will preferentially orientate themselves at 90 degrees to the direction in which the rock is being squished. So once again, if I'm compressing the rock from north and south, the minerals will align themselves east and west. And so these are the two ways we can get a foliation. There's simply a compressive, a physical force, or it can be due to recrystallization of the rock. And as the new minerals grow, they naturally orientate themselves at 90 degrees to the direction in which the rock is being squished. So here we go. So here we have an example of a foliated and a lineated metamorphic rock. Now I've got to admit this, temp this picture down here is terrible, but it's the best I could find. So in the case of a foliated rock, what happens is, is our platy minerals, our, you know, piece of paper like minerals will align themselves all parallel to each other so that remember they're like a piece of paper they're like a book with one layer on top of another so just like a book you'll be able to see the layering on the side and on the ends but you will not be able to see the layering on the top and the bottom so this is how we know we have a foliated rock because you'll see the layering once again on the ends on the sides but not the top or the bottom. So that means we obviously have platy minerals like a piece of paper. Now at the other, in the other end of the scale, we have the lineated uh, metamorphic rocks. So in this case, the crystals are long and slender, like a pencil. And so when we have a lineated rock, you will see the, uh, the foliation, the lineation, should I say, on the sides, on the top, but not the ends. So just think of it as you know holding a, a bundle of pencils. You'll be able to see the, the lines between, you know, the gaps between the pencils on the side of the bundle, on the top of the bundle. But when you look at the bundle end on, all you'll see is a mass of pencils. You won't see any kind of layering at all. So you can tell the different types of uh, fabric apart because foliations will have the layering on the ends and the side, but not the top or the bottom and a lineated metamorphic rock will have the layering visible on the top and the sides, but not the ends. So there are a few very common types of foliated metamorphic rocks, and these are terms you might be familiar with. Slates, phyllites, schists, gneisses. So slates, phyllites, and schists, well, they're all produced due to the metamorphism of a muddy sedimentary rock, a shale. So all that happens is, is they are a steady increase in grade. So slate is the lowest grade, phyllite's the intermediate, schist is the higher grade, and then eventually it will give way and give and form a nice. So each of these different rocks has nice distinct layering. So here we go. So here's a slate. So you can see it's got this rather dull looking appearance to it, but you can see the layering there quite clearly. Now, the reason it looks quite dull is because the layer, because the rock itself is just made up of clay minerals, and clay minerals, by their nature, are quite, you know, matte in appearance. They're kind of a dull grey. And so all that's happened is, is these clay minerals have just been forced to align themselves parallel to each other. There hasn't really been much of a change, actually, in the mineralogy of the rock itself. So it's still made of clay minerals, so the rock itself you know, has this rather boring grey appearance. Now, as we increase the pressure and temperature, what happens is the clay minerals begin to become unstable. So they start to change and they'll begin to change and the clay minerals will break down and they'll start forming chlorite and muscovite. And so what happens is, is your slate begins to take on a slightly shiny appearance. So this is going to be a phyllite. You can't see the mica crystals yet. They're too small, but you see they're there because the rock itself begins to look a little bit shiny. That's because, you know, that's the result of these very, very small crystals. Now, as we increase the pressure and temperature further, 
the chlorite will be lost, the clay minerals will be lost, and it'll and they'll both be replaced by mica. <coughs> excuse me, by mica minerals. And you can see it here. This is a piece of schist, and you can see it's not the greatest layering, but you can see the layering coming through here. And the rock itself is made up of uh, in alternating layers of mica crystals. In this case, muscovite. Uh, with quartz and feldspar in between them and so you have this rather nice layering with the sample now if you increase the pressure and temperature further eventually your schist will give way and form a nice and you can see the nice has this very very distinct light and dark banding okay so as we've already discussed slates schists and nices have their own type of foliation slaty cleavage schistosity and nicicity or niceosity depending how, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Phyllites on the other hand do not and so a phyllite is simply referred to as a foliated metamorphic rock. Okay so that was shales so that was slates, phyllites, schists and nices. I should point out though nices are not always formed from muddy sediments they can also form from igneous rocks as well so things like granites and you know other uh, felsic and intermediate igneous rocks can also give you gneisses uh, so there's actually a, a two different subgroups of gneiss there are paranices which form from a sedimentary protolith so a muddy sediment and there's orthonices that form from the metamorphism of felsic to intermediate igneous rocks. Now at the bottom here there's then uh, two more types of foliated uh, metamorphic rock. We have amphibol schists. Well that's this rock right here. Okay, So this is an amphibolite where it's been put under enough pressure where the amphibol crystals have all aligned themselves parallel to each other. So it's going to have this very very distinct lineated appearance. So once again, it's an amphibolite that's been put under pressure. So it's just like the amphibolite we saw when we were discussing unfoliated rocks. It's just been put under enough pressure to make the amphiboles align themselves. And then we have blue schist, the rock that we were talking about that forms at subduction zones. So blue schists are you know, rather distinct. They're formed from a basalt protolith and they have a rather distinct blue color due to the presence of two minerals, glaucophane and kyanite. So we've already seen these. And then we have, here's a blue schist. You can see the blue color, the blue tint to that the rock has. You can also obviously see the layering. Now, over here, we also have a, another type of rock, which is a green schist. So if we just go back here, here we have a green stone. So green stones contain chlorite, which is a platy mineral, like a piece of paper, actinolite and epidote, which are long slender crystals like a pencil. And so if you can put these, you know, this rock and the minerals in it under enough pressure, those minerals are going to align themselves. And when they do, what you end up with is a green stone. And you can see it here. You can see the green gray color and you can see the layering which is coming across like so. Now, finally, you will also get lineated rocks occasionally. Now, this is a picture of a lineated silimonite schist. The silimonite crystals are these big grey ones right here. And once again, just like the uh, the amphibol schist we saw earlier, we can see the, the foliation on the top, on the sides, but not the end. And so we know this is a lineated igneous rock, so the crystals are longer and slender. So it's, once again, it's just like holding a, a bundle of pencils. You can see the lines on the side, on the top, but when you look at the pencils end on, you can't see the layers. So the final question becomes, well, what happens if you keep increasing the temperature? Well, if you keep increasing the temperature, eventually your metamorphic rock is going to approach its solidus, isn't it? It's going to start reaching the point where it might begin melting. And this gives us a bit of a problem because there's obviously going to be that, that kind of transition period between a metamorphic rock, which is undergoing no melting, and an igneous regime where we start forming magma. So melting when it does occur in metamorphic rocks is obviously associated with very high-grade metamorphic rocks. So things like gneisses, 
granulites and sanolites. These are rocks which are being exposed to very, very high temperatures. Now, these rocks are all typically felsic, so there's lots of quartz and feldspar in them. And there'll also typically be a mafic component, a dark mineral, maybe something like a biotite, an amphibole, or a pyroxy. Now, things like gneisses, granulites, and sanolites, well, not sanolites, but gneisses and granulites can have layering to them, and that's going to be helpful to us. So what we end up with when, we, when we're kind of in this grey area is we have a rock that's not quite metamorphic, but not quite igneous either. And so we classify this rock as a migmatite. So here we have an example of a migmatite. So you can see we have you know this, these white areas here, they're dominated by quartz and feldspar. And we have these dark areas here, which by the looks of it is dominated by biotite. And you can see that this rock did actually have a layering to it. You can see there's one layer there, there's another layer there. We have another layer coming through here, another more sketchy layer there, and another layer coming through here. So this was probably once upon a time a nice. You know, so it had these nice light and dark bands. What's happened is, though, is the rock has reached a temperature at which it started to melt. And so you can see what's happened is, is these nice layers, these nice bands, the nice foliation that we had, has fallen to pieces. And so this, you know, where we see this kind of thing happening, where we have these nicely foliated rocks, but the foliation begins to break up and fall apart, we know the rock has started to melt. And so this is a great example of a migmatite. So migmatites straddle that gap between a metamorphic rock and the first stages of the production of magma. Okay, everybody. Well, that's it. I know that was a bit of a long one, and thank you for sticking with me. So we're going to, uh, obviously, in the next presentation, we're going to be dealing with sedimentary rocks. So, obviously, please make sure you keep the uh, code word for this presentation somewhere safe. Don't forget it. And I will see you in the next presentation. Bye.